Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again after that short break and thank you for your continued interest. Next, we have Lacnex Alejandro Acosta who will present on the topic of IPv6 for decision makers. Alejandro is an R&D engineer at LACNIC, as well as a member of other internet organizations. He was chair of the LAC task force, the IPv6 task force, IT manager and support for British Telecom, and a former member of LACNIC's electoral commission. He also coordinated the annual FLIP6 and Latin American IPv6 forum meetings. He has also been a TCPIP professor for more than 10 years. Alejandro will present the basics of IPv6, its importance for internet development and business cases that show that IPv6 is the best solution to the problem of address scarcity from the technical and commercial point of view. Without further ado, Alejandro, the virtual floor is yours. Okay, hello, Kevin. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, well, uh, good morning or good afternoon for, for all of you. Well, as Kevin said, uh, today I'm going to talk about IPv6 uh, for decision makers. And my mission today is going to try to convince you to deploy IPv6, of course, in case you haven't done so far. And first, when we talk about um, why to deploy IPv6, um, suppose you, you, you are a manager in your network or in somehow you have the one who can take decisions. Hey, should I deploy IPv6 or should I not? Uh, does it work to deploy IPv6? We usually start talking about how many devices are connected to, to the internet. And of course, we need to see also how much is going to grow this number of devices connected. And as you can see, let me use the laser. And in the slide in front of you, we're talking now about billion of devices. This is worldwide. It, this image is taken from was took uh, from a Cisco report. Uh, you can find the link on the slide. And you can see how that uh, we're one more time we're talking about uh, almost 30 billion of devices. This is much more of the population that exists right now. The colors that you can see on the graph uh, depends on what kind of device we're talking about. For example, the, the red one belongs to tablets, the yellow one belongs to PCs. Now we're talking about uh, TVs, uh, smartphones, and things like machine to machine. These kind of things are growing every year. And of course, the expectation is that this is going to continue. Okay. Now let's talk uh, more or less about the same, however, only about our region. As you probably know, in our region, uh, there are about 7 million users, okay, the population of our, our region. It is expected by 2023, okay, it is only two years from now about 70% of the population should be connected to the internet. In this moment, in this moment, it is about 65, something like that. Some countries, the penetration rate for the, for the internet is much more, but it is about 60, 65% in, in the region. And it is expected to grow about 10% per, 10 per year. Uh, having said that, we're talking that the number of users should be about 470 million users. But as all of us know, many of us, we have more than one device that gets connected to the internet. Having said that, uh, for example, only regarding mobile users, I mean, people with cell phone and things like that, we're talking that there, there, there must be about 520 million mobile users, okay? It means that many of us have more than one cell phone. Now, if we split it up a little bit more, let's talk about how many connected devices. One more time, it is only for our region. Okay, we're talking about 2.1 billion connected devices. Okay, this is a huge number. And you can see that this number represents about half of the 
available IPv4 addresses, okay? Of course, in our region, we do not have so many IPv4 addresses. And we can, we, we can think that it is 49% belongs to mobile connected and 51 wired or connected over Wi-Fi. One more time, this data was taken from a Cisco annual internet report white paper. Okay, I will, uh, I have like, uh, like this, I have two slides that talk about the timeline. I will try to be short in this because uh, my colleague Janina Pensky, she already talked about a little bit about this. So I will try to, to highlight probably the, the most important moments, at least from my point of view, that we can see uh, since the internet started to grow. We can see that in 1981, okay, this year, uh, I, am, I am very happy about this kind of things. Uh, it is the 40th anniversary of the IP4 standard, okay, on September is going to be this. And so in, in 1981, the first IP4 standard took place, okay. Uh, it was done by the ITF, the Internet Engineering Task Force. RFC uh, stands for Request for Comment. This is like the documents that specifically describe like all the aspects of the of different IP solutions like DNS, FTP, HTTP, that kind of things. So IP, IP4 uh, uh, was assigned the number 791. And if we read this document, it is more or less the same document. Uh, it's more or less the same specification that we're currently using. It's, it's amazing. The same IPv4 packet that was used 40 years ago is the one that we're still using 40 years later. So it, it is, for me, yeah, that, that kind of things are quite amazing. So this is story. This is history of the internet. It's, it's quite beautiful. Well, uh, eight years later, in 1989, the first commercial ISP appeared. It was called the World. Then I can tell you, for example, uh, back in 1992, there was the first RFC that was describing the IP for extortion. This is something unbelievable. We're talking about many, many years ago. I didn't even get out of the high school in this moment. Um, there was a document that was explaining, hey, you know what? The, we're running out of IPv4 addresses. The internet is growing quite a lot. If we keep assigning our IP resources in the same way that we have been doing so far, we're going to run out of IPv4 addresses very soon. However, uh, the, inside the ATF, few solutions appear to in somehow make IPv4 to last more time, okay? For example, a few of the solutions uh, became, uh, came out from the working group called ROAD. It means uh, routing and addressing. Uh, for example, I can tell you the CIDR solution. It, it, it stands for classless interdomain routing. For example, the concept of net mask appear here. Uh, also, let me move this, excuse me. Uh, also a NAT proposal, uh, I guess that you, you're aware of, of the concept of NAT, it means Network Address Transla Translator. And this is basically the solution that has made IPv4 to last so much time, thanks to this. What happened here is that we have a lot of private addresses, and when that private addresses need to get connected to the internet, it goes across a NAT device, okay? Uh, later, uh, as all of us know, uh, there was the, the boom of the dot-com, you know, a lot of WWWs websites, everybody wanted to have their own website on the internet. And if you are not in the internet, you are nobody and that kind of things that can happen at the end of the 90s. Um, back in 1996, the first uh, IPvS proposal appeared under this document. And now uh, going deeper to the IP4 extortion in 2011, IANA announced his IP4 extortion. Okay, they ran out on February of 2011. For the people who is not aware of who IANA is, IANA, IANA is, they assign 
the IP resources and other resources too. Well, let's, let's talk about the IP resources to the RIRs like LACNIC, like ARIN, like APNIC, AFRINIC, and RIPE NCC. Okay, we get the addresses from IANA. So they said in 2011, hey, I do not have many more addresses. I do not have any more IP for addresses. Okay, uh, continuing uh, with this, uh, I can tell you. In April 2011, uh, APNIC started using their last uh, slash eight. The same with adding in September 2015. Uh, in February uh, 2017, uh, we were already in the extortion phases. Uh, Janina took a uh, uh, talk a little bit about, about this, about, about the phases that we are. Uh, Ryben CC assigned his last IP for prefix. And as you probably are aware of, on August 2020, we, as LACNIC, we announced the assignment of our last IPv4 prefix, okay? So if you have heard, these kind of things are quite interesting. If you have heard many times during your life, during the last decade, hey, we're running out of IPv4 addresses. We are running out of IPv4 addresses. And very few times probably you have thought, hey, that that is a lie. I have been listening to this so many times. It cannot be true anymore. Well, you have been listening so many times that we run out of IPv4 addresses because of this. Because once you heard about the APNIC, that they were using the last IPv4 uh, slash eight address space. And the same for ARIN and the same for write. So this has been said so many times, but every time it has been true too, okay? Now, uh, well, this slide shows more or less the same as I was speaking of. Uh, it is uh, how the IPv4 extortion has been going on across the time. Uh, but basically, what they like, what we like from this graph, from this graph, is the, is that you can easily see that it is true that the amount of IPv4 addresses are going the amount of available IPv4 addresses has been decreasing over the time, okay? Take, uh, pay attention to this, please, okay? I have a very easy comparison actually here. Look at this. Um, on the left, I have one example. On the right, there is another example. So what is going on with internet and, and why should they move from IPv4 to IPv6? If we take the traditional phone line, suppose you have, you're in a city, okay, let's say whatever, 5,000 people, and you would like to give a phone, a phone number to each of them. But unfortunately, your numbering system only supports three different digits. If this is the case, you can only have, of course, 1,000 subscribers, okay? If you want to have more subscribers, you need to increase the number of digits available in your planning, in your addressing planning. So if you increase to four digits, you're going to be able to have 10,000 subscribers, okay? Quite easy. If we take a more or less the same comparison with the plates in, in the cars, it is more or less the same. If you want to every car to have a different plate, and unfortunately you only have three different digits, you can only have 1,000 cars with different plates. That's it. This is exactly what is happening with the internet. If we want to have more people connected to the internet, we need to increase the numbering system. That's it, okay? So having said that, what, what, what is all this important, okay? I have two different perspectives in this slide. On the left, it is from the end users, from the user's point of view, like all of us when we are using the internet, and on your right are from the ISP's perspective, okay? Let's begin with, with the left side. First, I want to tell you that one of the advantages that the user gets when it's connected using IPv6, most of the time, okay? Please, uh, highlighting most of the time, the, the person is going to have a, a higher access speed, okay? Is going to access internet faster. And this is not something that I am telling you because I like IPv6. I am, this is something that has that is based 
in several different studies across the world. Most of the time, when the people open different websites, most of the time, if they are using IPv6, the website is going to load faster. Okay? The second one is, this one I really like, uh, this is, there, there are less chances of an application to fail. For example, if we are going to, to I, I do not want to mention any specific video chat or something, but suppose you want to make a, a phone call using the internet uh, and you also want to have video. Sometimes the, the other end is going to listen to you. Sometimes it's going to fail. And more, many times also with the video. Sometimes you can see the person, the other, pe the other person cannot look at you back and that kind of things. That application is failing. And the reason why it is failing is because there is a nut in the middle, okay? There is a device that is going to translate your IPv to your IPv4 address to another one. When that kind of things happen, the applications, there is, there is a tendency to fail. Not always, uh, there are a lot of different mechanisms that are supporting uh, the NAT to make the application to work. But anyhow, if some someday you're trying to make a phone call and it fails, it is because of the NAT. And something that is like gaining interest in the end user is, the, is, is from, the, from, the, from the privacy perspective. The people do not like to be tracked. The people do not like, like uh, to know what, what, what the people is doing online and, and that kind of things. At least from the IP addressing perspective, uh, if you are using IPv6, you are getting, you are getting uh, more privacy, okay? Please keep this in mind. And from, from the ISP, and believe me, I can talk about this hours, okay? But I, I believe I only have uh, uh, about 45 minutes in my, in my, my first session. Um, okay, now let's see, suppose you're an ISP and you want to know which advantages or, or what you're going to win if, if you, deploy IPv6. First, I want to tell you cost saving. What well, you're going to, to have cost saving. I'm going to tell you a few things. For example, you are you're not going to have NAT. Okay, the translation I have mentioned, it is only for IPv4. So you do not need to translate the users that are behind or are using IPv6. Okay, so you're going to have few boxes, which brings you to the, to the next item, simpler network. If you are not having that, your network is going to be simpler, okay? That's it. Uh, the third one is fewer calls to the call center. Why? Because for example, the applications are not going to fail. If the applications do not fail, you are going to have fewer calls to the call center, which means that you need less personal, you need uh, less phone lines and that kind of things. And oh, the, the summary of all of this is your, your net, the network management of your is going to be much easier. Okay, why? Because you do not, do not have you do not have NAT devices. Uh, the routing is going to be simpler too. The the way you summarize uh, the IP addressing in your network is going to be simpler. Okay, so at the end, the network management is going to be much easier. Um, here you can see the faces that I previously mentioned, uh, and I know that Janina talked a little about this. These faces were not done by LACNIC, like, hey, we're LACNIC, we want to, to have those faces. These faces were constructed by the community. And basically what we do with these faces, we, as LACNIC, we follow the rules. That's it, okay? Uh, basically, you can see that there was a phase zero, one, two, and three. The, for example, the phase zero was activated when we reach the final nine, eight space, okay? Uh, phase one uh, were, uh, were assigned until reaching the final slash 10, okay? Reserved for phase two. In phase two, uh, uh, resources were assigned until reaching the final slash 10. And phase three, this one is quite interesting. 
it was activated in February 2017, uh, we were only assigning resources, IPv4 resources, only to new members. So if you are an ISP or any other organization that has IPv4 resources from us, you were not able to come and you are not able to come to us and ask you and ask for more IPv4 resources only for new members. Um, I said this when I was talking about the timeline. Uh, remember that on August 19, we assigned our last available IPv4 address. Okay. Okay, what happened with all that kind of things? Okay, now we have heard that in LACNIC, we assigned the last uh, IPv4 address last year, the same for APNIC, for ARING, and for other regions. The only one that has IPv4 addresses available in this moment is AFRINIC, okay? But okay, what, what happened with this? There is like a secondary market, okay? In this slide, it is described as IP address market. I want to, to say, to tell you uh, like a nice story, it's quite short, but in, in our world it's, it's like beautiful and it marked like a, a very important moment during for, for the IP addressing market. Back in 2011, okay, there was like a consortium and probably you know about the company Nortel. Nortel was, selling the, their cells, okay, okay, all the company. So a few companies like Microsoft and, and others, this story is available publicly on, on the internet, they were like pushing to like a bit to get uh, the Nortel company. But it is quite interesting that one of the assets that Nortel had that were very valuable was the IP address space that they had, okay? It was like, oh, I want that company, but maybe not because what Nortel means, and Nortel was a very quite important company in our world. However, the most important asset they said, oh, if I acquire Nortel, I am going to get the IP addresses that have been previously, previously assigned to them. And that in somehow mark the first price of the IP address market space, okay? Back in 2011. Um, as a comment, if you take a look, suppose that you need IP for addresses and you, you need, okay, going back, you need one more time IP for addresses and, and probably you cannot go to any RIR and you need to buy addresses you need, uh, today, as uh, August 2021, the addresses, the, the addresses, the cost of each address is about uh, between 20 and 30 US dollars per address. Okay. So if you want to deploy and you need 10,000 addresses, be aware of this. The, when we talk about this kind of cost, is when we try to, to tell the company, the entity, okay, perfect. Uh, maybe you need IPv4 addresses. That, that, that makes sense. However, Please also consider deploying IPv6. If you deploy IPv6, you are going to need less IPv4 addresses, and probably uh, you even do not need to buy IPv4 addresses. That kind, that, that kind of things can happen. So be aware of this. Okay, uh, regarding the how more or less is the statistics in, the, in our world, I can tell you, uh, for example, the top five countries, uh, regarding IPv6 penetration or IPv6 usage. Uh, we can begin telling you Belgium is, uh, has a quite big IPv6 penetration rate, Switzerland, Germany, Luxembourg, and the USA. However, I want to point out that many times the way you measure IPv6 is not the same. Okay, you can measure the IPv6 penetration for a country or for a region in very different ways. For example, from the end user perspective, for example, from the content perspective, from the BGP perspective, okay, there could be several ways to measure 
IPv6. And all of them are valid, maybe also from a DNS perspective. Okay, everything is valid. I have a few slides, a few more slides talking about this later. Okay. This one, for example, this one is, is from LACNIC. This one indicates out of all the autonomous systems that we have in our region, how many of them are announcing an IPv6 prefix. Okay. Uh, for this, this one is from the last year. However, the number, uh, I, I believe we've already passed 50% uh, of an, an announce, announcement in the, for autonomous systems. It is about 50%, doesn't matter that much. And this one is quite important. For example, you can see that long time ago, in 2006, the people was not even announcing IPv6. However, the people is doing it now. The organization have said, hey, you know what? I need to, I need to announce the prefix. Uh, if I announce the prefix, then I can use the prefix. Okay, let me move something here. Okay, why it is important to, to, to deploy IPv6? I, I hope, remember that my mission today is trying to convince you, and I'm going to do my best. Uh, why it is important to, to deploy IPv6? The first one is the global extortion of IPv4 addresses. That is the main one. Okay. If I deploy IPv6, I can save IPv4 addresses. If you take a look, how many IPv4 addresses should be out there? It's about 2 elevated to 32, okay? which is about 4.3 billion addresses. However, this is not completely true. If we, and I do not want to, to bore you with this, but if I do a math here, for example, taking out how many subnet, how many broadcast, how many reserve addresses are out there, you can only use about 3.7 billion addresses, which is much less than the population of the world in this moment. If we see how many IPv6 addresses are out there, well, this is 340 on the zillion addresses. One more time. Uh, very big number. Many people compare this kind of thing with how many stars are in the universe, how many grain of sands uh, are in the Sahara desert and that kind of thing. So it's amazing. Too many addresses. If we, for example, if we try to make a math calculating how much time do, do we have for using these addresses, we are in the year 2021. The program starts to run today with the current assignment rate ratio, and it can last until the year 2000, uh, 20,000, and we still have IPv6 addresses available. So this is amazing. We, we should not run out of IPv6, not anytime soon, okay? And uh, do deploy IPv6 is, is necessary for developing new business plan, like uh, services in the end user services, cellular network, IoT. I have a few slides about this at, at the end, Internet of Things, hosting services, data centers, etc. If I do not deploy IPv6, I'm going to have, as an ISP or any other company, a growing cost. Okay. For example, why? Because I, I'm, going, I'm going to have, I'm going to need boxes like network and translator or CGNs. This is the, the most commercial name for these boxes. It means, or it stands for carrier gray NAT. It is quite common to see uh, CGN boxes in many ASPs in the region. And I'm going to stop here just a second. And I'm going to, uh, and I feel sad sometimes because I have seen so many a small ISPs that are deploying CGN boxes in their network. And when I talk about a small ISPs, I'm talking maybe 1,000, 5,000 uh, users in the, in the ISP. And that is not good because the CGN boxes are quite expensive. One of these can cost probably 100,000 uh, US dollars. And that is a lot of numbers. When are you going to recover that amount of money? having only 1,000 customers and charging each of them uh, 40 bucks per month is quite difficult. Um, 
the transition from IPv4 to IPv6, and somehow it takes time, but if you do it uh, in advance, you are going to, you're not going to have interruption of your services. Your people is going to, 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 to be happy. You do not need like, uh, you know what? Uh, today in the, at night, I'm going to stop the service because I'm going to deploy a new C, uh, CM. Uh, Kevin, you know, there is like a, a, another mic open. Is it possible to close it, please? Yes, finally, Andrew, I believe um, our panelist, it can may have his mic on. Uh, thank, thank you for that. Uh, sorry for, for the interruption. Um, I want to highlight something quite important in, in, in this slide, which is that today, every operating system and most of the network device that we get are going to support IPv6. This is a fact in this moment. You can use Mac, you can use BSD, you can use Linux, you can use Windows, uh, Android, Apple, and all of them are supporting IPv6 since a long time ago. So do not be afraid of this, okay? Uh, uh, Janina also talked about, uh, about this. Uh, we, in LACNIC, we offer a uh, campus online where we offer uh, many different courses. IPv6 is... Um, one of the main topics that we have on, on our campus. Uh, we have um, basic IPv6 training, advanced IPv6 training. We have a more or less a new course, a new training that we, we sport last year, uh, which is uh, for massive network. It talks a lot about DSL, about cable modeling, and also in GPON. Okay, Gipong is one of the main topics in, in that training. And um, if you ask me, I, I really like the training. I, I took, um, I, I have seen a lot of videos of that training, a lot of presentation of that training. And um, if possible, try to take a look of that. Okay, it is basically about Gipong. However, it covers other many, we call it like massive technologies. Uh, massive because when you use Gipong, you're reaching a lot of people. When you use DSL, you're reaching a lot of people. Okay, probably uh, you are asking yourself, why LACNIC assigned me several years ago an IPv6 prefix? The reason behind this is the, the rules that we have to follow, okay? The policy manual. Uh, there are three different uh, policies. You can see all of them in this slide which explicitly describe, which explicitly mention that if you are asking, uh, I mean, that moment, suppose 2016, you were asking for an IPv4 prefix and you filled all the necessary documentation and LACNIC approved that assignment, you were going to receive the IPv4 prefix and also the IPv6 prefix, okay? The idea behind this was trying to encourage the organization to deploy V6, okay? So many of you probably in this moment have IPv6. Maybe you are aware of, maybe you are not. But anyhow, uh, in case you have your IPv6 prefix, this is a good moment to try to, to put it in production. Okay, suppose you do not have IPv6 and you want to deploy IPv6. What should you do first? What should you do maybe later? Which one are the steps? I would, I have a few slides about this and I, I can stop in, in any item if you wish, in case you have any question, please do not hesitate in, in putting it in the chat or, or in the q and I would love to listen any question that you have. Okay, um, first, I, this is more or less the steps. I have even more steps in, in other part the initial considerations, training, architecture design, investment planning, and deployment. This is like the macro that, this is like the, the, the big steps that we need to take. Of course, each of them has several different items. So if you have not deployed IPv6, play, uh, please pay attention to this. The initial consideration. <clears throat> One of the first thing, things that you need to, to be aware of is the transit provider. 
what we mean with this. I guess that you already know the answer, but suppose you're an entity, you are connected to the internet with an ISP. From our perspective, that ISP that is connecting you to the internet is what we call the transit provider, okay? It is good in advance to check if they support IPv6. Most of the ISPs in our region are supporting IPv6 as transit. So the chances that your upstream provider is able to I, give you IPv6 is, is quite high. Tell me. Hi, Alejandro, excuse. Uh, according to our agenda, we are supposed to have a short break right now. So I would like to invite everyone to take a short break until 11.20, and then we can resume uh, with the presentation. Of course, in the meantime, if you have any questions on the contents, feel free to continue putting those questions in the Q&A. So we're gonna have a short break until 11.20, and we'll resume with Alejandro's presentation. Okay. Well, we were talking about the first step that you, to, you should take care when deploying IPv6. Uh, I just said that you have to, to check if your upstream provider, what we call the transit provider, is supporting IPv6. And there, is a, there are a lot of chances that your upstream provider is going to, to be able to give you IPv6. Of course, we should also check your equipment, what you have in your network, your routers, your LAN switch, and so on. You have to, to check if they support IPv6. As I said a few minutes ago, there are a lot of chances that it do support, uh, that your equipment is going to support IPv6. Uh, if you ask me which devices do not support IPv6 in this moment, for me, it's very hard to tell you which one does not. Okay, and uh, we always uh, recommend that suppose that you have devices that do not support the PV6 for any reason, maybe those boxes have 10 years or more or whatever. Uh, of course, if you are going to, to buy new devices, new boxes, new, new equipment, please check out that they do support uh, IPv6. Uh, regarding the application, um, it is more or less the same as before. All of our applications are supporting IPv6 today. However, uh, you should take a look. Uh, there is a, this is part of the job. You have to check if your applications are IPv6 compatible or not. Uh, we know a few applications that do not support IPv6. And when I say do not, uh, we are not talking about very popular applications. We are talking more, mostly about in-house developed applications. Uh, one very common situations of applications that do not support IPv6 is the following. Uh, actually, I had a very nice story with this, and it happened to me uh, for the school of my kid. Which applications do not support IPv6? Many applications they have like they, they like to track for example which ip address the user is using when logging to the application okay suppose you open a website you put your username and password it is very common that the application is going to save in a database the ip addresses the ip address you are using to to open the website now suppose that in the database the application is only for the IP address field is only 32 bit long. It will only be able to save IPv4 addresses. Maybe it is not going to save IPv6 addresses. And it is worse that probably it's only going to save the beginning of the address, probably the 32 first bit of the IPv6 address, which is nothing at the end if you want to. To, to run a security analysis and that kind of things. But well, one more time, you have to check that your application is IPv6 compatible. We fully uh, recommend this. Of course, education and training. Uh, you need training for all your staff. Actually, we do recommend that companies that are deploying IPv6 
we do not want those companies like, oh, there are only one person or two people doing the full deployment of, of, of the network. You, you should in somehow integrate most of the company. I mean, marketing, product, even finance, engineering, of course, everybody should be somehow immersed of this deployment. Why? Because this, this one is quite common. Suppose that you are the network engineering guy. IT should be aware of this. Okay, why? Because the software, maybe the web server, the DNS server is, is running, of course, in the network. And if you are deploying, doing something in the network, you need IT to be fully aware of this. And if you're an ISP, it is nice and beautiful that the marketing people, the product people, they are aware, they, they are aware that now they are able to give IPv6 to the user. IPv6, giving IPv6 can be the difference between getting, between getting or losing a customer. Okay. And there is a, the last item. This is someone, this is something that I, I really like. Uh, very few times, maybe this, this is not happening that much uh, recently. However, you should not have people like uh, I have my IPv4 network supported by one engineering team, my IPv4 network, my legacy network. Now that I have IPv6, I need more people. No, that is not the case. And that is bad, actually. You should train your current IPv4 engineers, engineers to know about IPv6, okay? And that is the right way to, of doing things. Remember that in LACNIC, one more time, we have the campus. Uh, the, documenta the documentation that you can find online these days about how to do many, many different things. Suppose you want to deploy a web server. There are so many documents online. There are so many good videos that you should watch and learn how to deploy a web server, a DNS server, an NTP server, and anything that, that you want to do with IPv6. Uh, so do not be afraid of that. IPv6 is not like a new protocol. Some people uh, still believing that IPv6 is like something very new. That is not the case anymore. IPv6 is more than 20 years old. So do not be afraid of that. Today, anything that you want to, anything that you want to do has been done. Okay, it's very, the chances are very little that you're going, you going to do something so new that no one has had that idea before. Okay, that is not going to be the case. Um, and IPv6, one more time, is supported in all of the devices. Okay, a uh, few things that I, I, I really want you to be aware of. And we have seen some cases of people that did not follow these very easy rules. And at the end, they had a few headaches. Okay, for example, in the, the beginning, maintain IPv4. <sighs> Believe it or not, suppose you deploy IPv6, it is good to still have IPv4. If you do not have IPv4 in your network, I'm not, not even in your network, at least in the end user, there are a lot of chances that few applications are going to fail. Very few applications. Maybe the user is not going to even notice that they do not have uh, IPv4. Okay, and for the end user, it doesn't matter if, if it is IPv4 or IPv6. And I'm going to tell you one more time a story. Uh, believe me, I really love the stories. They uh, they tell things that are very nice, and we can learn from them. Few weeks ago, a good a good friend of mine, he was deploying uh, a network for an ISP, and he deployed the, the, the ISP. Told him, "Hey, my friend, I need you to deploy IPv4. I need you to deploy IPv6. Uh, thank you for that." My friend did everything the ISP asked for. However, he did not put IPv4 for a mistake. He did not enable the DHCP server. So the people was using IPv6, the devices were not receiving IPv4, and it, it took 12 hours 
cannot, man. it took 12 hours for my friend to notice this situation, but the ISP did not call him like, hey, my friend, we have some problems. I have customers complaining. That did not happen. Okay, and the, the, it was an IPv6 only network. Imagine that 12 hours and a full network with 2,000 people running, and the people did not notice that IPv4 was not enabled in that subnet. Okay? It was a quite interesting case. But anyhow, uh, you need, uh, there are a few applications that are still asking for IPv4. So in this moment, uh, to have IPv4 in the end user is still being important. Okay. When we mention use dual stack, we want you to give to the end user IPv4 and IPv6. If you do that, everything is going to work, okay? Avoid tunnels as much as possible. Uh, today, in today's technology, uh, to have tunnels, maybe, I guess you are not going to need this, but keep in mind that try to do not use tunnels. When, when I mention tunnel, I mean to have an IPv6 into an IPv4 or something like that. Do not do that and have native IPv6 transit. Uh, you need to avoid NAT as much as possible. This one is quite important, create an IPv6 address plan. This is something that we really emphasize when giving IPv6 training. You need to, it is a very important step if you want to do the, the things in the right way. And please do not forget about IPv6 security. Uh, we have seen people who have a, a very good security uh, features in their IPv4 network and they deploy IPv6 and they sometimes they forget in somehow IPv6. You cannot do that. Suppose you have a firewall protecting a DNS server in IPv4, that firewall should protect that DNS server in IPv6 too. Okay, be aware of that. Um, Investment planning, and this is something that you need to take a look to. There could be a lot of money involved from this. Probably you do not need any, any money because you already have CPEs that have IPv6. Maybe you have your all equipment supporting IPv6, but maybe when you are studying and taking the information, like doing a full survey of your devices, you need to identify which devices do support IPv6 and which one do not. Uh, hopefully, you do not need to invest anything. If you have to invest, take a look. Hey, I need to invest for deploying IPv6. What is better, to have CGM boxes to make that, to have more programs or not? Okay, that is up to you. I am not going to, to, to say anything else. Okay, um, I, I, sometimes I like to, to make a stop and just, and try to talk about something else because some many, many, few times technical things are not that beautiful. I wanted to show you a few statistics for Belize. This is going to be more or less quick. As you can see for July 25, uh, you already have your Julie, uh, Belize is doing some IPv6 and you are doing good. And in this moment you have a almost 8% of IPv6 penetration. This statistics is from the end user's perspective. If this statistic is telling us that eight people out of 100 can reach IPv6. This is not, this is not bad, uh, good for Belize. Of course, the idea is to have a bigger number in here. But in case uh, we're talking about decision makers, uh, this could be a good opportunity for many of you. I took, um, Top ASs doing IPv6 in, in Belize. Okay, you can see Central TV and Internet Limited, Centaur Cable, and Belize Telemedia Limited. Okay, this is the top ASs, the top companies that are doing IPv6 in their country. Um, if you want to compare yourself with the region in, in this moment, in our LAC, in Latin region, 26% 20, uh, uh, of the population of the internet users are able to, to reach uh, IPv6 and enable sites. This is not at all a bad number. If you come and now one more time, I do not have any other slide, but if we compare this number with the population worldwide, 
uh, worldwide is about 33, 34%. So we are below, unfortunately, we are below the global average. This is good. This is a good number to, to see because sometimes there are still people who believe that IPv6 is a myth or that IPv6 is not going on, that IPv6 is not happening. You can see that this is very real. If you handle, if you manage content, there are 26% of the population that can reach your website or your service doing IPv6. This is not a small number. And if you do it with IPv4, it could be more expensive because you need more devices and, and the performance for the end user is worse. Okay, I want to talk also about, about the future. And innovation. I was telling before, why should we deploy IPv6? And one more time, I want you to finish this session and be convinced, ah, you know what? Next week, I'm going to dedicate 99% of, of, of my time deploying IPv6 or convincing the CEO or the CTO or the one you have to convince. Look at, look at this. Uh, this is a very old slide but I really love this one. It has so many good information in there that if we take a, like a step-by-step, -step, a deeper look to every graph, it, it is beautiful. I, I'm going to start, I'm not going to stop in, in all of them, but at least in, in a few of them. Regarding innovation, I, I'm going to tell, I want to tell you what IPv6 can do for you. Suppose in the, in, the first, in the first graph on your left, there is a car, there is a luggage, there is a, a, a dog or a, pet or a pet and a person. In this moment, everything is getting connected to the internet. That's why it says internet of things. This is a concept that I know that you have heard before. Everything is getting connected to the internet and if it is not connected, it will be connected sometime in the future. The car is quite common to be connected to the internet. Now the car updates the GPS. Uh, he knows where the car is. He can identify other cars in, in the road. So in somehow it is using the internet right now. The idea and the bottom line of what I'm going to tell you is that if you want to connect, to connect all of these things to the internet, you should do it with IPv6. You cannot do it with IPv4. It is impossible. IPv4 is not going to support this huge growth of, of, of devices. The, the logash. There are some cases, and I, I love that kind of things, uh, basically mainly for the people who, who travels a lot. Today, it is common, if you go to an airport, of course, the pandemic has not, um, has stopped many of us of traveling, but suppose you go to an airport and you go to the counter of the airline that you're going to use for your trip. You are going to deposit the luggage in the counter, and the luggage is going, you do not know where, but you know, the, the, the case is that you deposit the luggage, the, the airport is going to take that luggage, it's going to, to go across many different roads, and it's going to be probably catched by a policeman, and it's going to through x-rays and that kind of things. But the case is that you can track your luggage. You can know, ah, you know what? I was going to Belize, ah, but they took the wrong airplane and now I am in Guatemala. You can know, ah, you know what? They know where my luggage is, okay? And it is in somehow connected. It is connected to the internet and the best way to track it is using internet and of course IPv6. Um, tracking the, the pets so today is quite common too. Uh, you know, um, the people who love pets they are really worried of losing a pet or in somehow a young in a mall or in a park and someone took my pet, you can track the pet. And you can go further. You can know if your pet, heart rate of the pet, you can check the tension of the pet, you can check the, the movement of the pet, maybe the, the, the temperature, maybe the pet is sick and you know where what is going on. So imagine that. And, and you know, many of you, I'm completely sure that you have a smart watches and, it is more or less the same for, for anything. Also for people, uh, sometimes they talk about children and elderly people. You do not want, you, just, you want to be, to know where they are. Some people uh, might be sick and maybe they do not know where they are. Maybe they are not 
mentally at 100, so you can track people. And this is the, the thing is that IPv6 is the, is the right way, the, the right approach. Agriculture, this is something that I love. And I have seen many cases of these in terms of things are uh, getting better on this. And sometimes I know that some people believe that I'm overreacting, but I am the, the kind of guy that believe that IPv6 can in somehow minimize the starvation of the world. Okay, I mean, poor people, more food. This is the IPv6 is the right way. And I'm going to tell you why. There are a lot, imagine a very big farm and there are, you, you deploy sensors everywhere in your farm. And the, sens the sensors can tell you a lot of things, can tell you if, the, if there is raining, the temperature, maybe it can somehow measure uh, some concepts of the, of the land, of the ground, where it is, the, 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 the wind, the wind the speed, the, 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 the wind the, the direction. And you know, as a farmer, when you have to, to catch, suppose you have uh, whatever, uh, carrots, you know when to get your carrots. And it is the same for, for example, for other things that are not agriculture, like for example, a cow. And I know that there is a solution in Latin America uh, for, for cows, it is called cow manager. And the people can know if the cow is healthy, more or less with the concepts that I mentioned of the pet. They know if the cow is moving, if the temperature of the cow, the heart rate of the cow. And in case the cow is sick, you can be proactive and take a decision like, oh, you know what? I need to take a look to my cow, um, do whatever it is sick, I need to do something for it, okay? Um, so it, I can mention a lot of different things in here, but I, I know that uh, it is too, too much time. Okay? I want also to mention, uh, remember that we're talking about the future, but the future is now in some half, uh, the tactile internet. This is an, a newer concept, the uh, Internet of Things, but I, I know that you are going to hear about this in the close future. You can see, for example, and this is something very real now. I know many clinics in Latin America that have the kind of robots, okay? Uh, one of them, a very famous one, one of the first, is called Da Vinci. The Da Vinci robot is a robot that can be used by doctors, of course, remotely to make a surgery, for example, uh, in, a, in a patient. This is something, something unbelievable. And I like this because probably your country, or my country, whatever, do not have the, the expert doctor to do a specific treatment or to make a specific surgery. But the doctor can be located, uh, let's say, in Brazil, and the patient is located in Santo Domingo, in the Dominican Republic, and the doctor from Brazil can operate the hands of this doctor and do whatever it needs. Okay, this is something that uh, it is, it is, it is exciting to, to this kind of thing. And this is something that is happening now. Okay, uh, well, the rest of the things are quite common. I can tell you, for example, this one, uh, I am, I am the, kind, the, the kind of person who believes that when you go to a hospital, maybe you are not going to be received by a nurse, maybe you're going to be received by a, a robot, and he can do the, like, the first diagnost diagnostic for you, like, hey, what do you have? Maybe the, the same robot can take you an X-ray, can see uh, vital signs, and transmit that to the doctor that is going to actually check you and you are going to save time, the doctor is going to save time, and everybody is going to, to, to be happy. I know that we always want to talk with someone, a real person, but for good or for bad, this is going to, to be the future, okay? You can see a doctor taking some vital signs here. Uh, regarding the, 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 the money, uh, IPv6 in, is in here too. The, crypto, the crypto, uh, cryptocurrency is quite common today. Um, but I, I am not... I do not know if cryptocurrency is going to, to, to for more or for less, and I do not want to speculate on that. However, uh, the, the good thing is that for at least the, the things that are, are based on blockchain, like cryptocurrency, IPv6 is in there too, because the machines that are connected to the blockchain 
with IPv6 are better. Okay. Now I want to move on and talk about the risk of not implementing IPv6. Uh, it will in somehow hinder the uh, emer emergence of new networks. Okay, if you do not have um, IPv6, uh, unfortunately, new networks are not going to be good. Uh, slow down the process of digital inclusion uh, of end users, make difficult new applications. Unfortunately, it will. If you do not deploy IPv6, it will increase the techniques of, uh, of using, for example, NAT. The cost at the end of not implementing IPv6, IPv6 will be higher. Maybe you do not want to deploy IPv6 because you believe it is expensive. Uh, in the end, it will be more expensive to try to support IPv4 with other techniques. Okay. Uh, this is uh, this slide, and you can see several uh, news about IPv6. They were not invented by me somehow. Apple tells application developed to use IPv6 as it's 1.4 times faster than IPv4. <clears throat> Facebook, and, and, and Diego uh, was presenting before of me from Facebook. Facebook news fits load between 20 and 40% faster of IPv6. Okay. Prices of IPv4 addresses continue to trend upward. Okay, it will be more expensive if you if you want IPv4. Okay, adopting and enforcing an IPv6 only policy. If not now, when? There are many news. I'm not going to, to read all of them for you, but uh, be aware of this. Of this. Okay, a phrase to keep in mind: countries that do not implement IPv6 are at risk of being isolated. Okay, we have seen few cases about this, about companies, for example, where the headquarter is in Asia, the, count, the, the, the branch is in Latin America, and they want and they need to connect to the headquarter using IPv6. Okay, now I am almost finishing regarding the deployment, uh, test web applications, test network devices, analyze your logs, the security devices. In LACNIC, we encourage people to deploy IPv6. But at the same time, we encourage them to do it in a secure way. Okay, IPv6 is not more secure than IPv4. IPv4 is not more secure than IPv6. The devices, your network is going to be as secure as you want, or as, you, or as, as much as you want, okay? Um, you, you always have to try to offer to the end user the same quality or better than you are offering to the end user now. What I mean with this, if you are giving a performance and with IPv4, you should try to match or give a better performance using IPv6, okay? Uh, perform packet captures and monitor traffic, uh, and the, we're talking about deployment, test network connectivity and routing protocols. This is something that, of course, before going to production, you need to check this out. You cannot go to production without testing everything. In LACNIC, uh, we are willing, and I can mention that we are also happy of helping you of doing this. If you are going to deploy IPv6, you can approach to us. I can give my, my, my email address later. Uh, I, I'm going to put it in the chat and you can contact us freely about anything. Hey, you know what, Alejandro, uh, I already put uh, BGP on the edge. What should I do now? I will try to help you as much as possible on this. Okay, this is a mini recite. I am not going to read it uh, fully. Um, I, I know that this webinar is going to be is going to be recorded so it will be available for you this is a very easy step that you can follow in order to deploy ipv6 starting from the numbering plan this is something quite good quite important i really encourage you to do this the best way the best possible way set up the bgp session with your stream provider uh, public services you have to, to do it and number your internal infrastructure, deploy for customer, uh, corporate users, deploy for, for the end users. Okay, look, that is like a step by a step. You can do one step tomorrow, another one in one month, another one in two months. 
And when you open and, and you close and you open your eyes, you have IPv6 deployed in your network. Some references. And that's that. It, this is what you have in Kevin. Thank you very much, Alejandro. A very comprehensive presentation there on IPv6 for decision makers. At this point in time, I'll defer now to our colleague, Guillermo Sicileo, who will lead us through the Q&A segment. Guillermo, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Uh, we don't have uh, any questions yet. Uh, we will give some minutes for the people to to ask some question if they have, but I will start with a question for you, Alejandro. Sure. Um, please, could you talk a little bit about the transition mechanism that that, that allow what is called uh, IPv4 as a service? Uh, do you think that this is something that could be helpful for for the internet providers to save IPv4 addresses? Thanks for the question, Guillermo. And totally, I, I fully believe in the, in the concept of IPv4 addresses as a service. And I'm going to tell, you, to tell you why, since it looks like we have time. What is happening with IPv4 as a services? Traditionally, when you deploy IPv4 as a service, what is going to happen is that the network of the ISP is going to be fully in IPv6. If that is the case, you do not need IPv4 addresses. If you do not have IPv4 addresses, you're going to save them. And you can use that IPv4 addresses for something else, like whatever, deploying other services, giving another service for customers, making more money with IPv4 addresses, or whatever. And I like this approach. Uh, this is one of, of, the main, of the main things. But there are other, like more, more technical ones. I'm going to mention only one. Uh, what is happening here? As I said, you are going to have, the ISP is going to have an IPv6 only network, which is quite good. You do not need to maintain IPv4 and IPv6 in, your, in the core of your network, which at the end could be a headache, uh, could be more expensive. It is like that there are more chances of something to, to fail. So uh, that there is a reason why I, I believe in IPv4 uh, as a service. There is uh, one me uh, transition mechanism, which is um, quite famous. I fully suggest everybody to, to read about it. It is fully proved. It is called 464XLAT. Yeah, I'm going to put it in, in the chat, the name for, for everybody. It is a standard, or, or at least there are a lot of RFC which meant about this one. It is fully deployed by a lot of different companies in the world. It started mainly in the, in the mobile data and cell phone companies. However, uh, fixed lines, landlines are starting to deploy this very same mechanism. Okay, thank you, Alejandro. Uh, please remember that uh, any one of you, if you have questions about the presentation, you can ask them in, in the Q&A section uh, in the box that is below. Uh, and Alejandro will answer that. Um, I have a, a, another one, a short one. Uh, you, you were talking about uh, deploying uh, IPv6 and some some incentives to do that. Uh, can you comment on the IPv6 challenge, uh, the Reto IPv6? I mean, uh, ah, sure. Uh, thank you for, for, for that question. I, I love it. Um, in LACNIC, we have something that is called IPv6 challenge. And we, and I, and if possible, I'm going to say it in capital letters. I would like to invite everybody. And now that we're talking with Belize, I do not remind of anyone from Belize uh, applying for the IPv6 challenge, okay? Let's begin thinking about this IPv6 challenge. In, in, in LACNIC, it is, uh, in, uh, it is something that started with the community. We have something that is called the IPv6 challenge. Basically, what we want with the IPv6 challenge 
is to encourage companies, entities, organizations, IPs to deploy IPv6. What do we do? And what the people has to do? The people initially, they have only to oh, uh, fill out a form, an online form saying, hey, you know what? They want to, they want to, to participate in the IPv6 challenge. And the person is going to send us, and when I say us, I mean a committee, to send us the, like the status of the current network. Like, hey, this is what we have. We have whatever, two different offices uh, in three different buildings or whatever, two different buildings and, and so on. And we want to deploy IPv6. And at the end, what we, what we want from the user is to actually show us, you know, during the time of the IPv6 challenge, which lasts about three months, we were able to create the IPv6 address plan. We were able to connect one office to the internet fully with IPv6. We were able to deploy three servers using IPv6. Um, so uh, I really invite everybody from, from, from Belize. I'm going to, to put uh, the link of the IPv6 challenge website. Uh, we should have one starting probably at the end of this month, working already on that. Uh, we just we just finished about four weeks ago, the, the previous one. We have two IPv6 challenge per year. And thank you for bringing, it, bringing this topic on I, for, for that, Guillermo, I appreciate it. Okay, thank you, Alejandro. I think that since there are some companies in Belize already deploying IPv6, they could be interested in, in applying to the Reto IPv6 or IPv6 challenge. Okay, uh, we don't have uh, any more questions. Uh, so I think it's time to, to go to the break. Uh, Kevon? Thank you very much, Guillermo, and thank you, Alejandro, again, for leading us through a very instructive and thoughtful presentation on IPv6 and deploying IPv6. At this point in time, we're going to take exactly a 10-minute break, a 10-minute break, meaning that at 12.09, we will resume with our last presentation for the day, a very exciting presentation, very relevant on cybercrime trends here within the Latin American and Caribbean region. Please stay tuned and we see you in 10 minutes. Me muevo por el fútbol. <laughs> 